Legally, you're an adult in the province of Ontario at the age of 18. You can make your own decisions and live with the consequences. And if you stumble, most people are fortunate enough to have one or two parents waiting in the wings to help. But what if the provincial government is your parent and you're considered a ward of the Crown? In our sixth season, we spoke with a group of experts, including two former Crown wards, who told us that the government was doing a pretty lousy job of supporting them in that difficult transition to adulthood. We'll look back at that conversation, then check in on what's changed in the four years since and how one of our memorable guests is doing. An update on those who've left care. That's tonight on The Agenda. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pagan is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. Almost half of children in the care of children's aid are crown wards. The government is their parent. In our sixth season, a youth-led group of former crown wards and foster children told us the government could be doing a better job helping them when they age out of the system at 18. Here's a look back at that conversation. Joining us now on the debate, Mary Ballantyne. She's executive director of the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies. Ian Underwood, member of the Commission to Promote Sustain Sustainable Child Welfare, and herself an adoptive parent. Will Falk, Executive Fellow with the Mowat Centre, and himself a foster and adoptive parent. Arthur Gallant, a former Crown Ward. And of course, we welcome back Shanna Allen from the Youth Leaving Care Hearings. Good to have you all around the table to continue with the discussion that I started with Shanna a few moments ago. Let's start, though, with some of the numbers. And Michael, if you would, let's bring these up. The province. As a parent, here we go, there are 17,000 as the number of children in care of the Children's Aid Societies in the province of Ontario. 8,300 is the number of children for whom the province of Ontario is their legal guardian. The province is their parent. 2,770 children are in care, living independently, some as young as 16. We've got more. When the province is your parent, 44%, just 44% of youth in care graduate from high school, that compares to 81% of the general population which graduates from high school. 68% of homeless youth have come from foster homes, group homes, and or a youth center. And 71% of homeless youth have had previous criminal justice involvement. What's been yeah. your impression of the hearings that they've been holding? I think they have done an outstanding job. I think it's been great to hear the youth and what has been really impressive is the youth taking charge of this on their own and uh, and that day having the number of them that were there organizing it, um, running the panel, asking the questions, uh, the maturity that they showed in their presentations, the maturity that they showed in their responses, I think we should be very proud of them. Great. Ian, you were at the hearings? I was indeed. What was your impression? I was going to echo the same thing, and I think that was part of the buzz among the adults at the hearings of just it, uh, it really reaffirmed for us and reminded us of the, the insight, the thoughtfulness, and the wisdom uh, that can and is coming from our youth. Uh, so it was, uh, there were adults that spoke at it as well, uh, but it was, it was just very affirming of, uh, of what inspired the hearings in the first place to have hearings about youth and by youth, uh, because nothing can replace you know, that kind of voice uh, on our side as adults. We're not close enough to the experience, and most of us haven't lived the kind of experience that the youth talked to us about over the last two weeks. Let's hear more of that voice then. I know your name's Arthur, but everybody calls you AJ, so I will too, okay? Okay. AJ, you, you were at these hearings. I actually spoke at the you hearings. You spoke at the hearings. What did you tell people? I told people about the issues that we're facing. I spoke about a number of topics. I think the biggest thing that I'd spoke of was feeling like I was abandoned as soon as I turned 18. Um, Go back a bit though. How, do, how, do, how was it that you came to be a Crown Ward in the first place? I became a Crown Ward. Um, I was born to a single parent. My father had left my mother before I was born and, and lost touch with my mother. 
and my mother is mentally disabled and was unable to take care of me so my grandmother stepped up to the plate and um, helped my mom raise me. When I was five years old my grandmother ended up getting Alzheimer's and ended up spending a, a good portion in hospitals and ended up going into a nursing home so what ended up happening was um, my mom just realized it was too much responsibility helping take care of not only my grandmother in her final years but also a growing son. So, so what happened to you? I was put into the Care of Children's Aid Society because my mom felt like that was the best option for me. And where did you end up going to live then? 16 different group homes and foster homes over a period of nine years um, all across Ontario. It's really, uh, I'm sure, easy to get that family feeling when you've lived in 16 different places over nine years, right? Oh, you betcha. No, absolutely not. Um, I, I, a definite big topic that we were talking about was that we lack a sense of belonging. When you're, especially when you're being bounced around from home to home, I think that was a topic that came up a lot during the hearings, was a lot of youth were feeling like we we're being shipped around, that we were, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but almost feeling like a parcel. And what ends up happening is you lose your sense of belonging because you're with these strangers. And, you know, the, the foster parents don't make you feel like you're one of their own, nor do their own biological children, nor do the, the, the other foster children who've already established a sense of belonging in the home. And you feel like a visitor, even if you're in a placement for several months or several years. Let me get Will in at this point. Will, you, you've been on this program before as the, uh, you know, the policy guy, but this is personal for you. Mm -hmm. You've done this. Mm -hmm. You've adopted. Yeah. How come? Uh, my wife and I felt that it was a way of, uh, of having children in our lives and, and giving something back at the same time. Um, you did foster parenting we, as well? Yeah, we did foster parenting both in the U.S. and in Canada and uh, adopted both of our sons. Uh, one in the U.S. And, and, and one in Canada. And Do you know whether the backgrounds of any of the foster kids that you've dealt with were as dramatic and difficult as what we've heard today? You, you know, I, I think you can ge generally say that, that kids who come into care come into care because one or more bad things have happened. And certainly the, the dozens of kids that I've known uh, either th directly or, or through other foster parents have all had similar stories. And they're, they're tough stories. I mean, I, I don't think that anyone is capricious about bringing kids into care. When kids come into care, there's a reason. Mm -hmm. Now, a AJ didn't tell us this, but I know this because I read his speech to the committee. <laughs> and that was, he had some real troubles in his background in terms of his own personal behavior. Uh, you know, he got, as he said, shipped all over the place. And yeah. his reaction was to lash out at everybody. And I think that's probably not very surprising. Uh, as a foster parent, how do you... Kind of deal with all I that. remember one of the things that I did in foster training in the U.S. was we, we, they tried to dramatize it for us as foster parents. They said, take everything, everything that's important to you and write it down on five or six cue cards, and then take those cue cards and tear them up. And imagine what that feels like. And, you know, right after something bad has happened to you that causes you to be taken away from your biological parents, you then put in with a group of people in a world that you have no idea about. Um, the struggle to make that permanent is very, very difficult. And, and I think it's something that people on all sides in the system try to do a good job at, really work hard at, but it is not an easy, it is not an easy situation. So AJ, from a policy point of view, when you turn 18, we understand from having heard from Shanna, you know, it, the clock stops in many respects, Absolutely. right? What do you think the government ought to do to kind of, from a policy point of view, change that clocking, the, the, the stopping of the clock, if you will? Uh, one thing that I had mentioned in my testimony at the Youth Leaving Care hearings and what I'm currently advocating for in a variety of forums is there needs to be a transition period. The clock shouldn't stop at 18. I'm not in a position to advocate um, and to put a new number saying the clock stops at 21 or 25, but those are numbers that I'm hearing from professionals in the field, but also from other Crown wards that I've talked to, there needs to be a transition period because you're, you know, your entire time in care, there's all this structure right up until I turned 18. Someone was telling me every day to make my bed. Someone was implementing a schedule from the time I woke up in the morning to the, you know, the time I go to bed. And I'm sure these other adults in the room here can say, this isn't exactly how you live your lives. Adults always have some sort of structure, but it's not structured to the minute. And I felt like they needed to kind of, you know, 
help me loosen the structure, but also tell, help me um, and tell me how to be a functioning adult. So encourage so your en independence. Encourage my independence, but also in terms of money, because I had everything paid for in this system. Hmm. Um, and I had a lot of great services that I currently miss. But there, I think what needs to be implemented is a system in which youth are also somewhat financially accountable. Let me or, ask Shan about that. Do, yeah. do, you, are, do you have kind of the basics of financial literacy well understood? I would say not in all aspects, no. I would say, I think that what's really important is that they're almost, they create, it's like a sense of parenting. Like, when you're 18, you don't call up your daughter, or I don't know if you have sons and daughters, but you wouldn't say goodbye, never talk to you again, mm -hmm. um, good luck on the rest of your life. You would somehow, you know, teach them how to become adults, and then maybe help them with their tuition or help them um, with support, like, mental or sorry medical and dental those kinds of things most 18 year olds don't have to worry about and i know that stats show that most people aren't really independent until the age of around 27 so to expect us who have been through all these challenges in our childhood mm -hmm. that at 18 we're going to be completely capable to go out on our own or at 21 say you know what you had a good run at it but now you're on your own an, exa an, an example that I was giving to some of my friends recently was that if, you know, friends that are my age, 21, 22, if they default on a credit card payment, for example, their parents might offer them a bailout. Even though I currently live with my biological mother, I'm not offered that bailout. If I get drunk, you know, at Young and Blue or at 3 in the morning and, you know, need a bailout, no one's there to bail me out, but other people my age who have parents you know, and who never really went through the system, their parents will offer that bailout. My parent can't do that because my parent is a province, not a person. How is it that somehow the province decided, in its wisdom, that at 18, that's it, they were done? I'm gonna say the, the, I'm gonna take the same position that Mary does on the why question. I think that it's over time we've developed the system, but there are clearly some things that we can do to really make a difference. One is, uh, we've begun moving towards having more permanency earlier. So uh, the, the province has through Bill 179 recently and su through some added funding helped to make it a bit easier for kids who are in r stable foster situations to become adopted. So, uh, I, Shan, I don't know the, the particulars of, about your case, but in a situation where you're in a long-term foster placement, there are actually barriers in the system to converting that to an adoption. So you could make it a permanent situation, but the state in its wisdom has until quite recently reacted to that by taking away some or all of your funding that you were receiving. So there's actually a negative, there's actually a barrier you there. Just there explain that. If, if, you're, if you're a foster parent, you do get a stipend you're from the getting province a stipend. to help these kids. Right. And, and in the U.S. now, it is the norm that that stipend continues for older kids who are adopted. Hmm. In Canada, that has not in Ontario, that has not been the case in many situations. Now, there have been some great CASs that have stepped up and done it anyways, but um, as we heard when we were doing our expert panel report, the ex it's clear that they're doing it against their economic interests, and that should not be the case. No? That's the same yeah, scenario with kinship, though. Yeah, yeah please right. go ahead. No, and for the viewers that aren't familiar with what kinship is, um, what CAS will sometimes do is look for a suitable um, family member to, right. to put the, the child or youth with. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening though is that if CAS were to put that child with a foster family, the foster family would receive the stipend, but not the extended family. Mm -hmm. And that, that tends to be a bit of an issue. So they, we should change that policy too. We absolutely, yeah. because you know, kids aren't cheap these days. And, the fa and I think it's better for youth that they stay with even if it's an extended family member, but sometimes the extended family member isn't ready or isn't able to take on the financial responsibilities sure. of the youth. Yeah. Dean, you wanted yeah. to say. Well, I was gonna, so there's a lot of storylines that we're on now, and I think let's stick with the funding one for, for a moment, because funding is always part of, whether it's in our own families or in the government as a family, how do we make decisions about what we can do for kids? So as, as Will has said, and this is something the Commission's done a lot of, of thinking about, how, how can we look at how CASs are funding, funded, and make sure that they have the latitude to make the choices that make the most sense for each kid. 
So today the situation is, and Will was saying this, CESs do have more of a financial incentive to keep a kid in foster care than to move a kid into a permanency situation, even with the same family. So we have perverse um, incentives in the system. And yeah, and no one's comfortable calling them that, but it does add up to that. And again, CASs are coming from the same place as all of us. We want They want to do the right things for kids, but they also are spending time worrying about how do they make sure the money they have next year is going to be enough for next year. And so because right now the funding is a bit organized around what, what was last year's funding and last year's volume, CASs are trying to keep that in place as opposed to part of where the commission is, is coming from and advising is having funding that is based on the needs in an allocated based in needs in the communities untying the hands of the CASs mm -hmm. so that they can make decisions for the Shannas, the AJs, the kids that they're working with. Let me with. get Mary to speak to that. Mm -hmm. Well, for sure, the uh, funding and how it should be allocated is always a, a tricky piece. And well, Would I you agree there are perverse incentives in the system? I would agree that there are parts of the system that make it very difficult to move forward on some of these pieces. And as Will was saying, some CASs do go ahead and, and make that work anyway, but it does make it often difficult for them to figure out how they're going to pay some of their other bills. So certainly looking at some of those funding issues so that we can move ahead on you know, on some of these pieces. But the other funding piece is, is that for children between the ages of 21 or up to about, well, anything over the age of 21, there's actually no funding at all. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, as you've heard, is definitely a group that, that could use more than just a change to our current funding Will. mechanism. Mm -hmm. There is there is a fair amount of money in the system. Um, where I think we need to start is where you started the segment, which is on outcomes, right? We know that we have bad outcomes um, or, or less good outcomes. We know that they're graduating at half the rate. We know that we have increased homelessness. We know that there are criminal justice costs. These are our kids, and we are parenting them, and we have to take that responsibility. That means that we should know immediately what their grades are, we should know their health status, we should know all the basics, and we should know that through the age of majority and past. And then, as Ian and Mary have both said, you know, we need to give our people in the field the tools to move the money around a bit. Um, in some ways, Steve, it's not dissimilar to healthcare in that way, right? I mean, mm -hmm. th with those 8,300 kids, that's all we're talking about. If we could focus in the efforts and really make a commitment here, whether it's more permanency or, or more funding later in life, th there are funds in the system. We're paying, I don't know, what's a group home cost in Toronto now? $195 a day? Is that a reasonable Probably number, guys? That, per person? Actually. Per person. For a group mm -hmm. home, yeah, you're up over $200. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're spending better than 75000 a year just to put people in group homes. So the, mm -hmm. the system has resources if, we're, if we can free it up and give the, the, the workers and the executive directors the tools mm -hmm. to move stuff around. Let me find out from our younger guests whether or not your impressions are the same as uh, Meredith Martin's. Meredith produced this program today. She invited all of you to be on. She attended the hearings and she came away feeling, or observing, I guess is a better way to put it, uh, that the clients, which I guess is you guys, didn't have enough time with caseworkers, bounced around from caseworker to caseworker, and when you did see a caseworker, the caseworker seemed overwhelmed at the least and exhausted maybe at the most. Shannon, does that sound right? I was going to say, I think there definitely needs to be improvements in the overall system. And again, focusing on the outcomes of individualistic needs because we are human beings. We are, we are all different. We all need different, we have different needs. And I do think there, there is a challenge with us social workers that they sometimes do have big, I shouldn't call us, well, they're called caseloads, right? They have, they have a lot of... How do you like being thought of as a caseload? <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's how it is, though, in reality. So um, I think it's a challenge, and I think it's something that needs to be looked into. But overall, focusing on the outcomes of improving those youth and their individualistic needs. AJ, what was your experience in dealing with a caseworker? I actually was one of the fortunate ones in which I didn't bounce around from caseworker to caseworker, but I felt like my caseworker didn't have enough time for me. He actually told me at one point that I think he had 30 clients scattered all over the province, and sometimes it took him a day just to commute back and forth for, 
you know, a one to two hour meeting, and it turns out I only saw him four to five times a year. And, and something that really affected me was that he only seemed to ever get a call when I was having a bad day or was going through an emotional crisis. He never got a call to say, AJ got an A plus at school today, or you know, we're celebrating the fact that AJ stuck with the job for three months. So his impression of you is skewed. I would believe so, yeah. And I mean, it just, yeah, it always felt like he had a negative impression of me or was always like looking him? down on me. Did you like him? I, I didn't have a very good relationship with him. He was the one who was legally responsible for me, and the thing about it was he didn't feel like a parent. I realized that the, the, the group home workers and the foster parents were the ones that had the day-to-day -day interaction, but I definitely felt like he had a negative impression of me because the only paperwork or phone calls he ever seemed to get about me were negative ones. Mm. And I felt like more could have been done mm. to have a better relationship and a positive relationship with the person who, was, who had to sign for me. Mm really important issue here and it's and and I think also at the hearings we heard a lot about workers and we also heard a lot of really positive stories about about from young people about their workers but the theme was we would really like to be able to spend more time with our workers and just as Shanna and AJ have said and not just when they have to fill in forms and not just when they have deadlines that they have to meet for the system's needs so this is we've had uh, a number of CASs have looked at this a lot and there are some studies that a group of CASs have done that are saying that today the workers who are professionally trained to spend time supporting kids like AJ and Shanna are spending 25 percent maybe 30 percent of their time with kids and families and that's what, 30%. as a province, that's what we want them spending their time doing. But they so, only sorry, what have... Are they doing, what are they doing with the rest of the 70%? Well, now some of it, some of it, AJ talked about being 16 placements all over the province. So as you heard AJ say, some of it is driving. Now some of that's unavoidable, mm -hmm. but, but, but that's a part of the equation of just where are the kids and how, how easy are they to get hmm. to. It's better for you to be close to home and it's better for your but worker. But it's also wherever the beds uh, are because of lack of resources. Uh, uh, right. Mm -hmm. And another big piece and probably I think if you asked any frontline worker their first answer would be they're doing paperwork. Their car is in the parking lot at the CAS and they're doing paperwork. Mm -hmm. And again to be fair I think we all understand that you know there's a lot of risks facing our kids when they come into care. We don't want this to be without rules and without uh, uh, paperwork. We talked about outcomes, that's important. The, uh, our you don't view, want to be overwhelmed by it either. Though. Our view is it can be a lot less paperwork mm -hmm. and there's a lot of redundancy of the paperwork that's there. There's a lot of paperwork. I suspect the two of you would agree that in some respects just add to the stigma and the reminder mm -hmm. that you're a kid in care. And I had a so, and, and sorry, the one thing I was gonna say is so if, if if we just a 10% reduction in the amount of paperwork that your workers are doing across the province would free up 1.2 million hours hmm. of frontline staff time to spend with kids. Now, when this works well, I guess the caseworker, or what, what do you call them? What's their title? Caseworker. Caseworker. Yeah. They can be a, uh, a wonderful mentor, presumably, for the. There's no question young that for many young people, the caseworker is their consistent adult mentor, coach. Uh, as close to a parent as uh, as can be if they don't have a good relationship with a foster parent or someone. But, you know, I do think it goes back to some of what Will was talking about, and that is trying to, it, it's not going to work so well for AJ and Shanna, but for some of the younger kids that, uh, that are either not even in the system yet or are already in the system, how can we uh, set them up um, through either adoption or uh, working things through with their own family, even if they can't live there, so that they do have these adult connections that, uh, that can be there for them. Because a caseworker will have anywhere from 17 to 27 cases, and, uh, and they're in the business because they care about you, but, but it's impossible. Are we, uh, yeah. Will, asking the caseworkers to be mother, father, bureaucrat, best friend, older brother, older sister? I mean, it sounds like they're having to bear a heavy load. Well, well the, the caseworkers, of course, have a basic set of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Many of them go well beyond that and uh, become the adult in their lives. But I think the consistent theme you're hearing is that just as any kid who's maturing, Crown Wards need to have an adult in their life. And that adult can be a caseworker, it can be an adoptive parent, and, and, you know, 
moving from foster to adoptive is very important because it means your chances of disrupting the placement later, having the placement break down is much less. But it can be some unusual people, right? It can be the teacher or the person down the street. I know one young girl whose adult in her life is uh, 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 the coach at the riding stable hmm. that she rides at. And, and she you know, is the barn hand there. And that's the adult relationship in her life. And I, you know, I think it's an adult relationship that'll carry this young woman through into, into um, equine college and, and beyond and, and has really made a huge difference. So where that adult comes from can be any number of things. You know, AJ mentioned kinship. I think there's a program in Brooklyn called You Gotta Believe that Pat O'Brien runs that just is focused on that issue getting an adult into the kid's life so that when the normal things that happen to 16 to 25 year olds happen, and they're going to happen, we've got someone there. Hmm. And, and I, I would add, is it, so the theme here, it, which came through so strongly at the hearings, was about that desire for adult connections to carry into adulthood. And if you think of it, for any of us, we've carried multiple adult relations into adulthood. So part of what we need to look at the system is where are the opportunities early on, later on, to grow and create and enable those relationships? Because it's not, and I think we've said it, it's not just the caseworker, it's not just the foster parents, but, and what are the circumstances to create it? And again, I appreciated, AJ, your story with the multiple moves, because as Steve picked up on, it's just really hard to create lifelong relationships when you move that, that much. Uh, Janet, did you have uh, sort of an adult in your life who you could look to as a quasi-parent mentor or whatever? Yeah, I did actually, not one specific. I had multiple different times. I feel like I always say the saying, like people, you get the people that you need, not the people necessarily that you want. Like those people, like I was lucky enough to have those people in my life. But I think it's important that we realize that like the outcomes that have been shown in the statistics show that it's not what's happening right now is not working. Hmm. It needs to be changed. How about your caseworker? Did you have one or many? Uh, my caseworker that I have now, I would say I have a really good relationship with. I had, uh, I had multiple. Uh, was it difficult to establish? A I of... didn't feel, I felt like I, I had some relationship, but it's, it's challenging. It doesn't feel real, I guess. Did you feel that that group of people or, you know, as, as you went through the system, were genuinely interested in what happened to you? They, I ha they, it's their job. They are interested, obviously. They're interested in you, but they don't always listen to you. And they, I don't feel like they always listen to you. Can what you give you me an example of that? Um, well, there was a time where I did ask to get moved out of my foster home because I was having a very challenging relationship. And I was just told, wait it out. You have until you're 18 and you can leave. And I was told that for two years. For two years? <laughs> wait it out for two years. And I did. Hmm. <laughs> um, just hmm. say it was a challenging high school <laughs> experience. And you waited it out for the two years? Yes. My goodness. Did you, it, was there a part of you that, that thought, this person really is doing their best, but they're just overwhelmed? Actually, that's what I always bring it down to. I always say it's just, just like I try to, maybe it's for my own comfort, but I say, you know what, they're really overwhelmed. They have a bunch of cases. But then I step back and I think, is that fair? Hmm. I'm a case and I, <laughs> I'm a case, and I'm, that's, I'm just thrown aside because they're really busy. Hmm. That's not really fair. Will, politics, as you well know, is about the art of the possible. What's possible here? You, you know, every time I see kids like Shanna and AJ uh, and the kids who presented at the hearings, I'm just, you, we simply need to do everything we can for these 8,300 kids who we are parents of. This is not a place to be uh, short-termist about this. Um, you know, uh, Ben uh, was on the show the other day, he said that every kid who spends an additional year in education is about 10,000 well, bucks. Ben Levin. Ben Levin. Yeah. And you know, there's lots of money here in the system. New minister has a new mandate and a new opportunity to really move this building on great work by Laurel Broughton, who was the previous minister who was now promoted to education. We actually, mm -hmm. actually, in the art of the possible here, Steve, we've had some great ministers here. We had Deb Matthews, we've had Laurel Broughton, we've had a few others who are no longer in politics. This and is now the, we in, have- uh, Child and Youth Services? Child and Youth okay. Services. And Eric Hoskins, by all reports, is a really first-rate first guy. So I think we've got an, an opportunity in Ontario around this cabinet table 
for this government to step up and make some stuff happen. You know what we've also got? $16 billion deficit, $240 billion debt. But Deb Matthews and Laurel Broughton are, are the places that are the big spenders. I, I think if you went to those two hat in hand and said, Deb and Laurel, <laughs> can we have a little bit of money for these kids, that they would both get that. Yeah, and, and then they go to and, Dwight Duncan, and Dwight Duncan would say, you, you $16 know, billion dollar deficit, but, but, but $240 listen, billion debt. How about if we take debt? the 3% down to 2.9 and take that little 0.1 <laughs> from health and education? But you can't put a education? price on a child's life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's another thing. I, I don't think it's always just about the money either. I mean, um, the Office of the Provincial Advocate has really been focusing on a whole government approach and what can all the ministries bring to the table? What can, how can Ministry of Transportation help? And it doesn't always come down to money. Like, we were just saying, it's connections, it's resources. It, and it, I know a lot of people see it as money, but it's not about money. It's not necessarily money. It comes down to other No, I hear you. Yes. And it's not, and but we can get better at spending the money we have yes. to do better. And Most we've got definitely. lots of uh, positive evidence to build on. So right now we spend 56% of our money in child welfare on kids who are in care. Uh, we know that the, the, pla when we, the places where they do the best is actually usually in the least expensive settings, the ones that are most family-liked, whether that is through an adoption placement, a legal custody placement, or a regular foster care. Mm -hmm. We know that's where kids do best, and they do even better if they're with kin, and even better if they're at home. Depending on the circumstances, there are exceptions. And we have lots of evidence that how do we get kids in those placements? the places where they can thrive, do the best, grow their roots, and, th and, and develop the relationships they need. Uh, we have a lot of evidence about how to do that well and how to spend our money so that we're doing the most good with what we can. Well, let me follow up with Mary on this, because I know it's not all about money, but it's a bit about money. And, There's no and, question. And uh, yeah. I want to I ask you about whether you believe there is a perception out there that foster parents, I don't know what percentage, but some of them are in it for the money. They want that stipend. Will's not shaking his head. I, uh, you can't see me, but I'm shaking yeah. my head too. But go, go ahead. But is that go perception ahead. out there? Well, I, the, the job that foster parents do for, uh, for the children in Ontario that can't be cared for in their own homes, there are the exceptions, but really they are exceptional people. They have children coming into their home that have had multiple issues uh, often, uh, sometimes in the middle of the night, um, and they go to great lengths to really, to really do their very best to take care of them. AJ, so, did you, okay, I want to hear yeah. from AJ on this. Did you think you're, any, any of your foster parents along the road were in it for the money? I had one foster parent tell me that directly. Um, tell I, you what? That they were in it for the money. I actually, I'm not saying this reflects all foster parents, and I'm not saying that this reflects the experience of all 8,300 Crown wards and all foster children, but I do know that I spoke to one foster parent and said, why are you really doing this? And she said to me, I'm a darn good parent to my own children. I don't get paid to be a parent, so why not be a darn good parent to someone else's children whose parents aren't there for them and get paid for it too? How much do they pay, do you know? I, I'm not familiar with that. I know it's I not I a know. lot, but yeah. what I do want to say, though, is that she's no longer a foster parent. I have confirmed that. But, and I mean, there are added expenses. Raising a child is not cheap, and I've already raised that. But when you're solely in it for the dollar signs, that's wrong. Okay, Shan, I saw you shaking your head, though. Was, that, was, was it ever your say experience? That, no, I was just going to say, um, I can't, I'm not going to shed light on my experience, but reflecting the 8300 we all have different experience again it comes down that we're individuals and I think that some foster homes there has been good connections and in the hearings people did say they had good relationships but there is also the lack of um, light that needs to be shine on those foster homes that they don't there isn't good experiences mm -hmm. yeah. but did you ever get yeah. the sense that some of your foster parents along the way were just in it for the money yes most definitely you did get that sense Okay, so I'm hearing from the people who run the system that, no, 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 it's not the case. And I'm hearing from two people who, who you know, who've been on the receiving end of it say, well, actually, yes, it is. Okay, back uh, well, to you. Think, okay. <laughs> I think what I was saying, in any, in any uh, profession, in any job, in any work that people do, you're going to get people that are in it, maybe not for the right reasons. But the money that they are paid to a large extent is to cover the expenses of, of having the children there. Um, so, uh, Can you give so us a the, sense of how yeah. much it is? I actually, I probably shouldn't. You know, Will? Uh, sure. I, I got $14.5 a day in the U.S. and 32 dollars 
in Canada is my recollection of it. Yeah. What did you think of the amount? Um, I, 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 I mean, we, we clearly weren't doing it for the money. I don't think most people do do it for the money. I think that there are people who are parenting who make the decision that rather than taking a job outside of the home, that they'll, that they'll add uh, foster children to the mix and that that'll help defray some expenses. I, I do think, absolutely accept that that goes on. I, I will say, um, I've known some really excellent foster parents. I mean, people who are among the, the sainted people that I've ever met in my life. Well, you know, uh, Michelle you Bachman, know. who's running for president of the United States now, when asked to talk about herself, mm -hmm. often says, you know, had five children biologically and 20, what is it, 22 or 25 uh, foster kids as well. It's, I think it's a, there's another really important part of the foster uh, care, uh, parent story, and that is the need to support foster parents. So it, as Mary yeah. said, um, it's, a ch it's challenging. having, and the, It's more challenging for kids coming into a home uh, in which they're strangers, but it is challenging as a parent. Will and I know this as adoptive parents of, of supporting uh, kids who haven't been in your life since they mm -hmm. were infants. Um, and so one, when you talk to foster parents about how can we we do a better job for kids. One of the things they'll say is sometimes we need more supports and the moves, yeah. talking about the multiple moves, sometimes those multiple moves are happening because we don't do well enough as a system at bringing supports to the home. We move the kid to a place where more supports are available as opposed to bringing yeah. supports for the home. Sometimes we don't do well enough supporting foster parents who are putting out the white flag saying, I need help. Mm -hmm. I need more money for a babysitter once a week so that my husband and I or my my sister and I can get time to to go away and just to get a breather. So we have to we all we do so no debate. No, no one's perfect, and you'll find imperfect people in every quarter of life. Uh, uh, but we have to look at if we want kids to be in stable homes that have relationships they can carry into adulthood that feel good and positive. How do we support those people? Well, let me follow. Just a few minutes left here, and I wanted AJ. Let me start this with you. It sounds like. A good adoption would, would address a lot of those issues. You know, you're not going from house to house to house. You actually are part of a family. You feel part of a family. Um, that sounds like a good solution. Was that ever an option for you along the way? It was explored, but I was such a broken child that no one wanted me. So, but you would you have been open to that or have wanted that? I really had, I didn't have much of a say in it. I mean, I was only 12 years old. I know that it was, um, there was foster parents who were open to the idea. But I think I had such a good connection with my mom that I didn't want to lose that because the theory behind it was that if I was a, adopted, um, CAS wanted to sever that connection until I was 18. Mm -hmm. And my mom and I were both very vocal that even though we didn't have the strongest relationship, we wanted them to put resources in to strengthening that relationship rather than strengthening a relationship with someone who wasn't that, my biological that, parent. That's, yeah. yeah, we're going to make the same point. <laughs> that, that's one of the legislative changes that has now happened, along with the removing of the economic barriers. Um, we, you know, we, we have a real shortage of both foster parents and adoptive parents for older kids, particularly in the city of Toronto. And people really need to think about this in their own personal situation and think about whether it's something that they could do because part of what we're talking about here part of the problem is that we're sending a lot of kids to oshawa and to wasaga beach, uh, wasaga beach because we can't find parents in the city of toronto proper who are willing to foster and Why not? adopt what, what would be different about 416 folks that they don't want to do this more than anybody else? I don't know the answer to that, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it may be in part that we have more kids coming into care. Mary, do you know? Well, I think there's a number of different uh, reasons. The, um, uh, the actually foster parents around the province of Ontario, it's becoming more and more difficult to find them. When you've got two parents working away from home, there, you know, there's the change in that demographic, uh, the size of, of people's home, just being able to accommodate families, um, you know, accommodate more children. When you're moving into the downtown parts of Toronto, you've got, you know, smaller accommodation. Um, so there's a, a large number of, of issues that, okay. and, and it's also me, very I'm, difficult. I'm down yeah. my last minute yeah. here, and I want to give it to you. Yeah, I yeah. was just going to say, I think it's important to recognize that there's not one solution. Adoption's not a solution. Right. Yeah, Money is not a solution. Right. And I think the report that's coming out 
from the youth that spoke at the hearings will shed a lot of light and all these people will be um, contributing their thoughts and their ideas and I think it's important that people still make submissions and the submissions you're able to make until January 3rd and then people can still what they think the recommendations that they should be because I think the government is responsible. There's no one answer and I think that's that's what really needs to be focused But the people on. of Ontario also need to start speaking up and and because their tax dollars are the ones that are going to pay for the quality of the care that Crown Wards are are, are receiving. So I think the taxpayers, now that they're watching this program and seeing all the media coverage, they need to speak up and say, I don't want my tax dollars to fund a system the way that it currently is. Because we're all sitting at the table acknowledging that there's a problem here. Um, we just may bring different solutions to the table. I want to thank all of you for coming in tonight and helping us thank with you. this discussion. Ian Underwood, the Commission to Promote Sustainable Welfare, on the left-hand side of the table. Will Falk, the Executive Fellow at the Moet Centre, and Mary Ballantyne from the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies, and if I may say, uh, last and certainly not least, Arthur Gallant and Shanna Allen. We thank you for coming in and sharing your stories thank with you. us, your wisdom, and we wish you all the luck in the world thank going you. forward. Thank you. Thanks so much. Much has changed since that conversation in 2011, and we'll be right back with an update on what changes to Ontario's adoption rules have meant to kids in foster care, right after this. Thousands of children in Ontario depend on children's aid societies, but the numbers have dropped over the past several years. Contributing to that drop are changes to the rules around the adoption of kids in foster care. Let's find out more about the situation from Pat Convery. She's Executive Director of the Adoption Council of Ontario. Really good to have you here. Thank you. Can I just get you to start by, you know, we just had that uh, discussion four years ago about state of play back then. What's changed most significantly since then? Okay, so that, that, just after that show was when the government announced um, an ability for kids who were crown wards and who had an access order to parents to be adopted, which freed up essentially 7,000 yeah, 7, children mm -hmm. at that time. Purpose of which was to increase the number of kids who could be adopted, but also maintain their connections with their birth family. Most recently, in September, the ministry announced some increased um, supports for permanency for children, which were increased in targeted subsidies, so subsidies for families who do adopt children, particularly older children, sibling groups, um, to be able to meet some of the special needs that those children have, um, as well as some post-adoption support programs, funding of that, so, um, and then some increases around kids who are staying in foster care, some of the older children, for those foster parents to be able to keep them and offer them that, those family supports for a longer period of time. Okay, let's unpack some of this yeah. then. Why, why were kids with access to birth family members previously not allowed to be adopted? Well, they were allowed to be adopted, but they had, there was a, a legal process that had to happen to terminate the access order before they could be adopted. That's actually still the case, but what the new legislation allowed was for it not to be a barrier to adoption. Okay. So children could be placed for adoption. You still have to deal with that access and turn it into an openness order. So it was recognizing that it's important. We want children to maintain those connections, and so changing the process to make it um, more likely that a child could still have a family, have an adoptive family and their birth family connections. Okay, let's talk money. The financial ceiling on help for Crown Wards used to be age 18. Mm -hmm. Now it's age 21. 21, Why the yes. change? Um, again, because we recognize that at the age of 18, um, many kids are in the foster care system, don't have their grade 12. Um, they still have a need for ongoing supports. Um, available to them. So in terms of the foster care, um, the youth leaving care hearings talked about let's raise that to 21 at least and in some cases 24. The government also recognized that that becomes a disincentive for adoption in the sense that families need supports as well mm -hmm. or a youth who has to decide do I become adopted or do I stay in care and get this extra support? So the, um, the, the government recognized we need to put some supports in place because those families are still dealing with and helping and supporting um, those children. Given a, uh, a deficit in the province of Ontario that's north of $10 billion, are you surprised they came through this way? 
It's, no, I think the government recognizes how important this is. So the case has been made for the ROI, return on investment. Mm -hmm. I think that in your last session they talked a little bit about that. Um, now they're recognizing that the return on relationship is equally important. Return on kids, relationship, yeah, okay. Yeah, ROR, because mm -hmm. kids need families. And they need, we're looking at families for adults as much as for children. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, right now we have 6,300 crown wards. Um, 3,700 of those, about, are over the age of 12. Those are the kids most at risk of aging out of care, and we need to find them families, and those families are going to need support long into their 20s, as we know our kids aren't leaving home at 18 anymore. I don't know if you know these stats, but let me ask anyway. How many kids were adopted out of the foster system since the changes took place that you've described? So we have between 750 and 950 children per year placed from the foster care system for adoption. About an equal number of those kids are going to be placed with kinship families as well, so another form of um, permanency for children. So would the changes that have been made increase these numbers going forward, do you suspect? Yes, it has increased. It has increased yeah, already. Definitely increased. We still have about 1,000 kids every year that are going to age out of foster care. So we still have a little bit of work to do in that. 1,000 kids, eh? About, yeah. Again, we don't... Um, keep our stats as well, but we know just in terms of those kids over the age of 12 moving towards 18 um, and the number of kids we've placed for adoption over, say, 15, 16, we know that there's a misconnect there. So. Sure. Let me ask you the more uh, sort of uh, philosophical overarching question, which is uh, what's the ultimate goal of the foster system? So the goal of foster care is clear. It's when children can't live with their birth families, um, foster care allows them to have a family environment while the child welfare system tries to sort out what is their permanency plan. Either let's fix the problems that happened in the birth family so they can go back home, let's find somebody in their extended family who can take them and give them that permanence they need, or let's move them to adoption, find an adoptive family. And is it your preference to have children adopted out of the foster care system? Absolutely. Foster care is a great system, but it has an expiry date. And so we do believe that families shouldn't have an expiry date. And the way to do that is when foster families are able to adopt, which these supports will allow, is a great way. Um, and if not, let's find a family that can be there for life for a child. We mentioned earlier that the financial assistance that the government of Ontario provides now lasts until age 21 instead of age 18. But can you give us a better sense about what kind of support is out there for families that do want to provide foster care? Yeah, so for adoptive families, again, recognizing the need for older families, to, older children to have families, the targeted subsidy the government now offers, um, and this is a go-forward basis, is um, up children over the age of eight um, or sibling groups adopted from foster care are eligible for a targeted subsidy um, for families who make, and it, it was 85000 it's going up to 94000 as their joint annual income. It's about $1,000 a month. The subsidy is $1,000 um, a month. The subsidy is about $1,000 a mm -hmm. month per child. Um, previously, it ended at the age of 18, but the new um, plan going forward will be that that will be in place till children turn 21. And does the money actually go to the kid or to the family? To the family. Yeah, so it's to support, and again, you can even, as an example, you're, you're adopting a 16-year-old, your hope is going to be able to support that child to go to post-secondary education, but you only have two years now to open up an RESP. So even just thinking of the, those supports that you haven't had a whole lifetime to plan for for that child. Now, 1000 bucks is better than nothing, but what percentage of actually, what percentage of the cost of actually raising that child and having that child be part of your family does that actually pick up? What it's going to pick up is those extra supports, tutoring, counseling, um, special programs that are benefit post-secondary education. So you still need to be able to manage the cost of the child. So it's certainly, um, it's not going to pay for your, your mortgage for the room, those things. But it's definitely a huge support for the families. It's, People you know, don't do this for the money anyway, do they? No. They don't. No, exactly. And foster parents don't either. I think that's the piece that is allowing more foster parents to adopt those children that they know are, they would like to have as part of their family for life, too. Gotcha. Pat, thanks very much for this. You're welcome. Pat Condry, Executive me. Director, Adoption Council of Ontario. Up next, you heard from former Crown Ward Shanna Allen earlier in tonight's program. She's now here to tell us what life has been like over the past four years, right after this.
Shanna Allen drew on first-hand experience in her efforts to shape changes in Ontario's child welfare system. Four years since we last spoke with her, Shanna is now back to tell us how she's been doing. So we welcome her back, the former Crown Ward, Shanna Allen, to TVO. It's great to see you again. Thank you. It's good to see you, too. So you are how old now? I'm 24. 24. And let's just, a, a little bit about your background for those who didn't see you last time you were here. You're from where originally? So I'm originally actually born in the States. Okay. And, and made it up here how? Um, well, my parents separated and my mom moved to Cernia to find her family, actually. Okay. And then what? And then, so I, uh, when I was nine years old, I went into care. And uh, that was because, unfortunately, my mother had a mental illness and uh, she was really struggling. And, um, and dad was out of the picture, I presume. Yeah, he, he was in the States. So uh, once I went into care, um, my mother didn't have very much support. And unfortunately, a couple years later, she actually committed suicide. Hmm. Going into care for you meant what? Um, so it meant living with foster parents. That's what it meant for me. I was a crown ward at that point when my mother passed away. And I was living with temporary parents who, um, you know, they provided a house, but not necessarily all the things that a parent would provide. And this was where? What city? This was in Sarnia as well. Still in Sarnia? Yeah. Okay. And you did that until what age? Until the age of 18 when I aged out. You age, that's the expression, right? Mm -hmm. You age out at the age of 18? Mm -hmm. And then what happens? Well, for me, I went away to school, but when you're 18, that's when you pretty much lose most of your supports, unless you are in school. So because I was in school, I had support till I was 21. And support means what? So support means like financial support, um, having a worker that you can call, um, but and um, some health benefits, but at the age of 21, that's all gone. And do you kind of feel like you're on your own at this point in life, or do you still have some access to your former foster parents, or what? I definitely feel like I'm alone. I, I actually, like, by the age of 18, I still like created my own supports, but and I had connection with my worker, but at that time I was pretty much on my own. So you, province of Ontario then held hearings, right, to sort of figure out how to reform this system? Yes. Yeah, so then um, at that time, like I, I wanted to advocate for change, and I thought that because of my experience wasn't a good experience, I wanted to you know help other youth and children who were going to be going through the system. So I um, applied to the office and I started working with the advocate's office and we came up with these hearings, yeah. which is where children, youth, they, you know, they told us what was really not going well in the system and what things she needed to change. How did you get, uh, I mean, where, where did the notion of you participating in this process begin anyway? Mm -hmm. So it was just like a job posting like any other. And um, before this, I was really involved in advocating for children and youth. So when I saw the posting, it was something that I really wanted to do. And I know that the system uh, needed fundamental change and it still does. And I think that that's why that's how I applied to the job, and then it just grew. We didn't know what we didn't know what was gonna the, all the challenges we were gonna come across, but uh, we found out a lot. <laughs> you went to post secondary. Yes. Where'd you go? Wilfrid Laurier. Is that where you went? Yeah. Okay. And <clears throat> what happened there? So I graduated. I did graduate in 2014. Thank yeah. you. Um, big accomplishment. And what'd you uh, graduate with? Uh, my teaching degree. So it was a bachelor of education and a bachelor of arts. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Now it's four years since you've been here yep. in that chair. Mm -hmm. How's your life different now? Um, well, I would say I was going through a dark time. Um, even though there was a lot of great things happening, it was really hard to, you know, handle. But I think uh, since then, I've, you know, I, I, I went and taught overseas. I, uh, Where'd you go? I went to Egypt. It was a really good experience, yeah. Teaching what? I was teaching uh, English and social studies. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy it? It was a different experience. It was good, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. Different sometimes is a way of saying not good. No, it was it was good. It was just I I would like to be teaching here. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So have you scored a teaching job here yet? Um, I'm on a supply list, but I'm uh, not working that, all that much. So uh, still looking. It's it's hard because I don't know if it's because of my circumstance, but uh, it's about those connections, right? And mm -hmm. as a child and youth in care, like it's hard to get those connections to principals and parent or like parents who are principals or teachers I don't have that necessarily whereas my friends who are really getting a lot of calls they have those connections their parents or teachers or so it's been a little bit challenging how do you overcome starting so far back compared to everybody else mm -hmm. honestly looking back like I don't really it's hard to explain like I think um, like I had some of those supports in place where a lot of youth in care really don't have those supports in place and um, I wasn't in group home care. I wasn't homeless. I, you know, it's how you deal with something. Like I, I dealt with it by pushing forward and forgetting. And some people, you know, they, they, they go to crime or they, you know, they have different um, ways of dealing with things. So. How tough to stay positive? 
Uh, it's challenging. Some days, eh? Yeah, definitely. There have been some changes made, though, to the adoption system. Pat Converse mm -hmm. talked about them. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So I think adoption is great for those youth who are and children who that's an option for. But some children, like myself, like that wouldn't have been an option because for me, I wanted to live with my mom. I wanted her to have those proper supports. And some youths have already created their support systems, which is after my mom passed away, that's what I did. So you know what I mean? Like that's for some youth, that's what works. And I'm more concerned about those invi in, um, invisible youth or who I think are invisible, like the ones that are homeless or have special needs or, you know, in group homes that don't have that option. Any other changes that uh, have, have not been implemented that you think ought to be? Um, there's a lot, actually. I think that the one thing that the re my real life book, um, the report, was saying was that the system needs to fundamentally change. It's not just little things here and there. You know, it's, it's really from the bottom up. I mean, some things like, I think the group homes need to be reviewed. I think that, um, you know, I just think there needs to be better outcomes for youth in care because, you know, if it was your child, you would want the best no matter what pathway they were going through, right? No matter what they were going through. I've got your next job. <laughs> You run for office. Yeah. Run for office. Okay. Get elected. <laughs> make the changes. How's uh, that sound? We'll see. We'll see. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> if I can't get in teaching, then I'll, I'll continue on that path. Put it this way, Shanna. I wouldn't bet against you. Mm -hmm. I think you're doing great. Thanks Thank a lot you. for coming into TVO tonight and updating us on your life. Great. Thank you Shanna so Allen. That is the agenda for Thursday, November 19th, 2015. Tomorrow, we'll take you behind the scenes of one of the more tense moments in Canadian political history when three politicians hung out in a kitchen in Ottawa to exchange some constitutional ideas for our country. Jean Chrétien, Roy McMurtry, Roy Romano, the three amigos of the Constitution, here tomorrow on the agenda. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leader since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.